Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow, and the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, Please go to mybigfootsighting.com. My Bigfoot sightings began in Alaska as a young child. My father was a state trooper up there. They carried on through Oregon, Cascade Locks, Oregon, Hood River County. He was a deputy in Hood River County. We lived in a small town called Cascade Locks. They continued into my adult life here in Colorado and overseas when I was in the military. We're going to focus today on a couple stories. The ones in Alaska, I didn't really understand what I was looking at or what I was seeing. The ones in Oregon, the first one was terrifying story. I was eight years old. There was four of us, Steve, Chad, Shane, and uh, Charlie. We were out at Wyeth, which is seven miles east of Cascade Locks. Now, this is in the Columbia River Gorge. It has a huge river, and anybody familiar with the Pacific Northwest understands what the Columbia River is. They ship and move goods and services and barges up and down that river. So it's not a small river by any means. And Oregon sits on the south side of that river, Washington to the north. We had bicycled out to Steve and Charlie's house. They were brothers out there in Wyeth. And that's where we would enjoy our time. There was an old Civil War cemetery there for the people that had built the original locks, the original area to move ships up and down the river around the rapids. Now there's the Bonneville Dam. As we set out from Charlie and Steve's house, we cross a dirt road to a field. You look up the side of the Cascade Mountain Range. You're facing south, and there's a slide area there, very large black boulders. You can see the highway when you start to climb. The highway's down by the river and as we climbed as we walked up through the aspens and to the pines we were all just laughing and joking and pushing one another we were young stupid kids having fun just a bunch of guys out looking for adventure that's what we did there we continued our climb probably took us 20 30 minutes and we stayed in the boulder field had already slid years and years ago, but we stayed on the boulder field looking for treasures, I guess you could say. We made it halfway up the boulder field. There was a little spring coming out of the side of the mountain. You could see it. Trees were very dark. It's what we call black brush. You can't see your hand in front of your face because the blackberry bushes and huckleberries and just the growth of trees are so dense in that area. We decide to make our way over to the spring to get drinks of water. We're foolish boys. We don't bring canteens with us. We're not Boy Scouts for sure. We're all over there getting our drinks of water and two of us come back. That was Chad and myself. Chad Barron and Shane Barron were brothers. And then Steve and Charlie were brothers. Steve came back with Chad and I and Shane and Charlie. They were a year older. I believe Charlie was three years older than us. 
and they came running back from the spring, screaming, saying that it was red eyes. It was huge. We all just laughed because they were always trying to scare us. And we said, well, we'll go protect you. You know, we're eight years old. We're not going to protect much of anything. So we all ventured back to the spring. And Charlie was very big. He wasn't fat. He was very well built. Charlie and Steve were lumberjacks with their father. And this is back in the 80s, the 70s, actually. Would have been 77. And they were lumberjacks. They were young, but their dad was a hardcore, carry his chainsaw up the mountain, carry his axe, and he was very, very astute with that. So Charlie wasn't a small teenager. We went back there, and Charlie was scared to death. He didn't want to go back to that spring, and it was only a foot or two inside the black brush. And we poked our heads in there and felt around with the water. It's coming out of the rocks that were there and we hear this low growl and the first thing that i thought of growing up in alaska and idaho was a bear i'd heard bears click their teeth they, they snap their jowls is what it's called and this sounded like a bear and that's what i was expecting and i was thinking we have roused up a bear and We'll scare it away by screaming at it. But it wasn't a bear. We got to see it. We got to see what Charlie and Shane were so scared of. It had red eyes. There was really no smell. You could see its head. And its eyes were probably a foot apart, maybe 18 inches. You know, you're looking at a this from a child's eyes, an eight-year-old. We didn't know what to do. It wasn't a bear. We knew that. It wasn't an elk. It wasn't a deer. It was growling. And as we stepped back onto the boulder field, the rock fall, it stepped out of the brush. It stepped over the little spring and as it stepped, it towered over us. It was eight, nine feet tall. It was the whitest thing I'd ever seen. And it was still growling, very deep guttural growl. Wasn't really baring its teeth, but we weren't really focused on getting an accurate picture of this thing. We were more focused on getting out of there. We all started making our way across the boulder field as fast as little legs can carry you without falling into these boulders that are the size of cars, jumping from one to another as fast as we can. We get down to the tree line, which was probably 100, 200 feet to the north of us, so we're going back towards Wyeth, back towards the Columbia River. And it starts throwing rocks. These aren't small rocks. I wouldn't have been able to move one of these rocks today, and I'm in an incredible shape. They're very large, probably three, four feet in diameter, if I will. And they were flying over our heads and hitting the aspen grove below us. That's a long throw. Now, granted, it's a steep hill, but that's a long throw. We raced through the Aspen Grove. The Aspen Grove probably ran 150, 200 feet, and it dropped off onto the road in a steep embankment that they would get the sand out of there to sand the highways during the wintertime. And we all came tumbling down that, all screaming, and made it to the road, not really understanding what we were doing, what we were seeing. We all turned and looked to see if it was still following us, and it was literally knocking down trees. We were watching trees just get tore apart. The tops of the trees, it was like somebody was in there swinging a large axe, 
and felling trees. It never made it to the edge, but it was one of those places that we never went back to. That night, we were staying at Charlie and Steve's house. It was Shane, Chad, Charlie, Steve, and myself. And we decided to tell Charlie and Steve's dad what we had seen. And he, he just laughed. He says, oh, you saw Sabe. And we're like, what is a Sabe? He goes, it's what the Indians call Bigfoot, Sasquatch. He says, they're thick out here. You might want to mind your manners when you're up in the woods. They don't like us because we hurt them. So when you go up in the woods, let them know you're there. And they'll leave you alone. So we read some tales of the Firefox series. That was one of the big books that we loved to read back in the day. And we decided we're going to go scare each other and we're going to hike half a mile from the house to the cemetery. We walk into the cemetery and we make the announcement. We're here. We're not looking for you. Please don't look for us. And we were getting pine cones thrown at us, not dropping, being thrown at us. We decided it was probably time to just go home and crash out in their living room and wait for morning. And then we'd get on our bikes and go the seven miles back to Cascade Locks where Shane and Chad and myself lived. When I got home, it was probably 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. I asked my father about it. He was a Hood River County deputy tasked to Cascade Locks, Oregon. And he just blew me off like I was nothing. Said that I probably saw a bear, just didn't understand what I was looking at. I told him time and time again, no, this is what I saw. This is what it looked like. He never believed me until we went to Kingsley Reservoir on the side of Mount Hood. We went fishing and camping up there several weeks later from the first. My father and I, we flew in on a float plane. We, we were pilots. Well, he was a pilot. I was learning. Still eight years old. It was May 18th, 1980, because Mount St. Helens was making her rumbles. We were flying over. We've left Kingsley Reservoir because I said, Dad, something's wrong because Mount Hood was shaking violently. I remember that. And there was ripples on Kingsley Reservoir. We got airborne, and you could see Mount St. Helens to the north. It's beginning its eruption. And my dad pulled out his camera. He had an Icon 35 millimeter camera. He was, loved that thing. Told me to take over his pilot and get us as close to Mount St. Helens as possible. Keep to the west so that the ash didn't interfere with the uh, 182's engine. It was a Cessna 182 um, Romeo, if I remember right. As we were flying over Mount St. Helens, where he's taking pictures, I have one of them hung here in the house. He caught a glimpse of something running, and he asked me what it was. He said, that's the biggest bear I've ever seen. And I said, no, Dad, that's the Sabe. That's what we saw in Wyeth. And so I took us down to about 400 feet. We were over the Tootle River watching the mud flows come down. And it literally leapt probably 20, 30 feet from one side of the Toodle to the other. It was a short area, but it was the biggest, ugliest darn thing I'd ever seen. And it was exactly like the one that I had saw in Wyatt. And I asked him, what does he think now? And he says, well, we don't talk about it. 
we'll never talk about it. So we flew around and took some more pictures, landed back at Cascade Locks, and he jumped in his patrol car and did what patrol officers do when you have a natural disaster like that. Then I went home, rode my bike home. I told my mom, and of course, she didn't believe me either. But I told her dad had seen it, and dad would talk to her when he got home. They never spoke of it, but it's vivid in my memory. I never lost it, never forgot. I remember the smell of the hillside. I remember the size of the rocks. I mean, you could drive down that interstate now and see the exit for Wyeth and look to the south, and you'll see the hillside that I'm discussing. You'll see the large boulders, the boulder field. It's there. That's really close to the Pacific Crest Trail where it comes down to the Bridge of the Gods. And that takes me into my third encounter in Oregon. I had a motorcycle, a Trail 90 Kawasaki. It was green, an old bike. And I had a German Shepherd named Joe. And Joe would follow me until his foot pads would bleed on the trails. But he loved being with me. I mean, I didn't go fast. I just went a long ways. But motorcycles back then, you could foul the plugs pretty easily if you weren't leaning it out just right. And I was climbing the trail, Pacific Crest Trail, before it was even the PCT. Climbing to the south, out of the Bridge of the Gods, Joe was following me, and it's so green up there. The moss, the ferns, everything's so thick and so lush. It was beautiful weather, but it's Cascade Locks. It's the Columbia River Gorge. It's its own little rainforest. You get up to a certain point that's called the Power Lines. I don't know how many miles it is, but the power lines run through there. They come off of Bonneville Dam, and they feed power out. Bonneville Dam is a hydroelectric facility. And the power lines that run up the side of the mountain, it's an area that you can ride motorcycles and four-wheel drive pickups, things of that nature. And I fouled my plug just as I got to the power line. It was a beautiful day. You could see the rain coming in, coming over the top of the Cascade Range, coming from the coast. Shadow and I were sitting there, and I got my toolkit out, pulled my spark plug out of my green Kawasaki motorcycle. And sure enough, I had fouled it. I always carried a spare. So I was putting it all back together, and I heard that growl i heard that that it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up you know something's there joe wasn't scared of anything joe had taken on bears joe kept himself between me and the tree line but he didn't growl he just stayed focused hyper focused on that tree line and as I'm sitting there thinking, this is another Sabe, this is another Sasquatch, Bigfoot. We call them Bigfoot. I was terrified because I'm by myself and I only have my dog. And I'm trying to put my motorcycle, my spark plug in. And doing that when you're terrified, you really don't have much. As I sat there trying to put it in, I had growling coming from behind me, too. I turned around, and there was a pack of wild dogs who were running the power line. We had known about them, but they were coming fast towards me and my dog. And I thought, well, that's the growling, and we got to get racing down the mountain, get away from these dogs. And about that time, the very large Sabe 
stepped out of the tree line and made this god awful bark this not even a howl it was a bark it was loud it hurt and those dogs spun and took off running it sat there and watched joe and i for 10 minutes just sitting there not growling not doing anything just watching and i kept talking to it saying i'm not here to hurt you i'm sorry i'm leaving i was terrified because i've got something that's 10 times my size just looking at me like i'm lunch i heard some voices coming up the trail backpackers I didn't know if I should warn him or whatnot. Joe got really irritated. His heckles came up, and he, big German Shepherd, he started a low guttural growl, and I grabbed onto him and told him no. And those two backpackers came up, saw me, and asked me if I was okay, if I need anything. I said, no, no, everything's fine. They're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll leave you alone. And they kept on hiking up the trail, and I'm looking, and it's not there. It's disappeared. And even Joe's looking like he's not even paying attention to the people that just passed us. He's trying to figure out where it went. It just disappeared. Started the motorcycle. Started down the trail. And there was two little ones. They couldn't have been more than three feet tall. And they were jumping up and down on a log. Like they were enjoying watching me ride. I wasn't scared after that. I realized they weren't there to hurt us. But I don't know where they come from. I don't know where they go. I just know that we haven't found every mammal on this planet. I've seen an awful lot of things in my years. I've seen an awful lot of things in combat. Things that don't make sense. Here in Colorado, I live in between two mountain passes on US Highway 160. Levita to the east and Wolf Creek Pass to the west. And as a truck driver and a hunter, an avid hunter and backpacker, I hike the San Juans and the Sangre de Cristos all the time. And my wife goes up with me. She calls my elk in for me. We're archery hunters. We backpack. We've done part of the Continental Divide Trail. We've hiked in the Blue Lake. I've four-wheel drive into Platoro area. I've ridden my dirt bike and my ATVs all over up here. Setting up for what I thought was going to be normal because I have not seen a Sabe in a long time. I think the last time was in Germany. And it really caught my eye. I was in Grafenbeer during a training exercise. And I made a call on the radio to ask what units we had available in the area because I had something. We called them non-biologicals. Yeah, they're biological. But when you don't understand it, you try to figure it out course they brought in a helicopter and all kinds of stuff and never saw it again it was just a flash a blur but i knew what it was people tell me that there's a smell i would agree to the smell if it's been raining like a wet dog or rotting flesh but if it's not been raining in a while, there's really no smell unless they've been swimming. I've 
been face to face with some things that I have no explanation for. I can't say one way what they are or what I think they are. But here in Colorado, on Wolf Creek Pass, there was a listener of yours who talked about a wolf, a werewolf, something of that nature. And where he was discussing and describing, I know that road well. And I know exactly what he was talking about and where. But I had never seen or heard of his encounter. Now, his encounter was July of 2011. My encounter with Sabe was probably at two, three hundred yards. I was just west of the ski resort on Wolf Creek. Kind of drops off back behind the ski resort, drops down in this great, big, beautiful meadow. Hard to get to. You can get to it on a bicycle or a motorcycle. You can drive up to it on a car, but that's it. You have to bike in or walk in. We were, my wife and I, moving our trail cameras down through there looking for the elk. There's quite a bit of elk in that area and moose. I noticed something moving across the side of the hill. And I asked her, I said, do you see that? And she said, no, I don't see anything. So I gave her my binoculars and I pointed her in the direction. I said, you don't see that. She says, no, I don't see anything. So I took my binoculars and I looked and I can see it clear as day. Got her to focus on it. And she's like, no, there's nothing there. So we started hiking towards it. Thinking, well, maybe it's a brush or rock outcropping. It's a beautiful day. It's warm. We're in t-shirts. And I watch it jump. I watch it disappear. She never saw it. Clear as day. She never, ever saw it. And it makes me wonder if the manifestation occurs to certain people and maybe not to others. So I was taken aback by it. I wasn't mad. I just said, you didn't see it? Okay. She said, what was it? And I said, I'm not sure. Look kind of bearish. I don't know, but we got to keep our eyes open. There's, there's bears in here and they're, they're a little ornery. I've had plenty of bear encounters where you know, you're not supposed to be there. So she doesn't see it. And I'm questioning the things that I saw. We continue walking up the path. And it's, it's a decently wide path. You could take a motorcycle on it or bicycle. You could pass one another. It's a wide open field. It's absolutely beautiful. Green grass, flowing water, and just, it's one of those fields that you would think uh, to see in a movie, Lord of the Rings or one of those fairy tale type movies. It's really, really pretty. And it's on the backside of Wolf Creek ski area. As we continue our walk, I see a moose coming up at us. And this moose is coming up at a pretty good clip, which makes me question us being there at the moment. Cause I'm, I don't have a gun. Neither does she. We're just scouting. The moose didn't even realize we were there. It went flying by us so fast. It was terrified of something. Now, something was chasing it. It was black, but it never came out of the trees. I could see it. She was thinking, she goes, is that a cougar or a mountain lion? I said, I don't know. I can't tell. It's dark. It, it, the sky was daylight. It was a beautiful day, but it was dark, very dark colored. And the reason I remember the body is because of that story from the gentleman about Wolf Creek. And I went, wait a minute, we don't have black cats up there. So what I saw was what he was describing, but it was so far away, it was probably a good quarter mile. It was at the bottom of the draw, the bottom of the drainage. That just took me back to that moment. And that's why I was like, I've got to let these people know 
the things that I've seen. Maybe it'll help somebody else. Maybe somebody else will say, you know what? I was in that area and I saw something. I'm not sure what it was. I couldn't make a positive identification, but it was large and it was black. And whatever it was, it was big enough to chase a huge moose up out of there. And that's hard to do. So we went back to our camp. We were staying the night up there, setting up our trail cams, getting ready for elk archery season. Archery season here is all of September. This was three years ago. I haven't been able to hunt for two years due to an injury, but hopefully I get fixed and I can get back up in the mountains. We popped our rooftop tent, set up for dinner. I had the camera set up for a really nice, perfect area to take pictures. We climb into our sleeping bags up in the rooftop tent. And the rooftop tent's a really nice tent. It was on my Toyota Tacoma. It was a brand new Toyota Tacoma. We bought it in 2020 for the wife. We were sitting there. And we didn't have, we don't take our dogs with us in the mountains to see if we're going to. We've got chickens and animals here and protect the kids on the property. We leave the dogs here at the house. But we were laying there, and of course, the rooftop tent has lots of windows. You can open them up and look out them and zip them down so you got fresh air. And we got some wind, gentle breeze coming up through the valley, coming from the Pagosa side, because where we camp, you can look down in the valley and see the Boot Jack Ranch. And that's the ranch, the valley that that gentleman was talking about in 2011. It's called the Boot Jack owned by a billionaire oil magnet out of uh, Texas. He builds pipelines all around the world. Very nice guy, but he owns an awful lot of property, and it's known as the Bootjack Ranch. He throws a lot of money at politicians, so you always see them coming in in a gaggle of vehicles and patrol cars because, like I said, I drive that route in a semi from Del Norte to Pagosa or Cortez and back delivering ocean containers. We were laying there in our sleeping bag and just giggling and talking and all the birds, all the animals just went dead silent. It was the creepiest silence that I've ever heard in the woods. And when Everything goes silent. You know you've got a predator in the area. That's just common knowledge. When things go quiet around you, you have a predator in the area, or you have made enough noise that it calms them down. But it doesn't calm birds down. Everything went quiet. Even the wind stopped. I grabbed our flashlight laying there, and I'm just looking around, scanning the area. It's... We got stars. We don't have a moon up yet, but where we live, it's dark sky. So you can see the Milky Way clear as day from my back porch without any light. And it's absolutely beautiful here. So I've got the flashlight ready and I can hear something coming up the hillside. Now this hillside's pretty steep. You can hike it but it takes a lot of energy. You reach out, standing on the hillside, and you're hitting it with your fingers. It's really steep, but it's all knotted like grass. So there's footholds, elk trails. The elk are thick through there. And I'm thinking, okay, I've got an elk coming up. This is going to be really cool. I'm going to wait for it to crest and turn my light on, which... Basically, it'll freeze an animal. They're, they're like, what, what's going on? Where'd that come from? They don't understand. So as it's making its way up, I can hear it. And then it gets real quiet. And I'm thinking, okay, well, the elk can scent us. It's not going to come up. And I turn on the flashlight, shined it in the trees, probably 
20 feet away from where we were at in the tent. And it was no elk. It was another Sabe, another Sasquatch, another Bigfoot. This thing was huge. I'm 53, 52. I'm six foot two, 225 pounds, and I'm Bill. This thing made me look like a midget. This thing was an animal, huge. And I've got my flashlight on it. I'm watching it. It's not liking the light. It's trying to duck its head down, duck around behind a tree. And I'm thinking my camera's right down where he just walked up. I'm going to have great photo. I'm going to have great images on my trail cam. It kind of just scented, lifted its nose and sniffed, and put its face down, and then just disappeared just turned and took off. You could hear it. It was crushing brush going down. It wasn't scared to let you know it was leaving in a hurry. But I checked the video cam. I went down. We climbed out of the tent and went down to the camera where it was positioned on the tree, opened it up and turned it on. And the camera had taken lots of pictures. There was nothing in those photos. Absolutely nothing. And I know it walked right by that thing. We left the cameras up, put camp away the next morning after breakfast to come home. This is mid-August, getting ready for archery. We'll come back towards the end of August, pull our cameras, throw them on the computer, and look at all the wildlife. Usually I have a couple hundred elk, 50 to 100 deer, several bears, moose, over the multiple cameras I have. We bring the cameras home, pull their SD cards. Oh, we got lots of pictures. There wasn't a bird. There wasn't a elk. There wasn't a deer. There was nothing. It was snapping pictures of nothing, just the trees. Daytime, nighttime, no squirrels know nothing that's the first time i have ever hunted that area where there was not teeming with wildlife everywhere but we hunted we hunted that year that was my last year of hunting and she bugled up a bull and he came up the hill he was a massive six by absolutely beautiful and i was standing on the road and so I'm trying to get down behind a choke cherry bush and get a clean shot on him with my bow. She got him to about 10, 15 yards of me. I pulled the wrong pin and chucked the shot. I, it was horrible. She bugled him again. He spun around and he was coming back at me. And I was knocking another arrow, getting ready for another shot. She dropped her backpack by accident. She didn't realize she'd bugled in a bull. And he turned around and booked it. I didn't have a clean shot, so I just let him go. And she asked me what was going on. I said, I got to go find an arrow. I chucked a shot. And she was laughing at me. You missed a elk? I said, yeah. I said, you bugled in this big, beautiful bull. Said, your husband pulled the wrong pin. What an idiot. We got a laugh out of it. It was hunting's for us is meat in the freezer. But if we don't have a successful year, it's okay because we'll go buy a cow. We'll go buy a whole pig and have it butchered for us. But being outdoors, that's my life. I love being outdoors. I love being in the mountains. My wife does too. We love archery. We love fishing. We love ATVing. And I've got a jacked up Jeep that I take up Mount Blanca and Madonna Creek. But we love being in the outdoors. It's our passion. It's our life. We'll be back in Alaska here pretty soon. I'm going to sell the Colorado properties and move back to Alaska. Been looking at properties up there. We spent two weeks hunting. I wanted to find that bull again. I found him. 
He was up a tree. That bull, probably 11, 1,200 pounds, maybe, maybe nine, was drug 20 feet up a tree. I don't know too many men that can drag a bull elk up a tree. I don't know what would do that. There's no tracks. Bodies shredded. I don't even know if it was the elk I had taken a shot at. But it was up in a tree. Carcass. I looked at the wife and said, I think we should probably venture out of here. I think our hunting's done this year. I haven't seen any game other than that. And it's just not going to work for us this year. She asked me what I thought could have done it. I told her. She said, do you think they're here? And I said, yes, I know they are. She was kind of freaked out. We were clear down in the bottom, which was quite the hike out. That area is what we call steep and deep. And my wife's only five foot. So we hiked out, took us about four hours. And as we were getting to the top, the sun was setting. It was getting dark. And whatever I saw the night before was standing at our kitchen table at the camp. It looked at me. I knocked an arrow. I was going to drill it. I didn't know what was going to happen. It looked at me and just slowly turned away and just walked. It didn't run, just walked. And I looked at my wife. I said, did you see that this time? And she goes, it was a bear. I said, a bear stands on its hind legs and walks like a human. Where have you ever seen that? Well, what else could it be? Well, maybe that was a Sabe. That's a Sasquatch. That's, that's Bigfoot. No, 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 no. Yes, my love. That's Bigfoot. We walked over to where it was stepping because I had cleaned out an area for our cooking and for the fire and stuff and clear as day big track probably 13 14 inches huge track but nothing like i'd ever seen it actually had claws on it not like bear claws but toenails sharpened claws i guess you could say it was the weirdest thing i'd ever seen i've seen a lot of images that people have posted of Bigfoot footprints and castings. So it takes me back to that story of the gentleman who saw the wolf or werewolf on Wolf Creek Pass. Is that what I'm seeing up there and thinking it's a Sabe? It's not angry. That was the weirdest encounter I've ever had. It's always something that's piqued my interest to try and figure out what is out there. I know we have things most humans cannot comprehend as I have was part of a task force that moved things from Groom Lake facility, also known as Area 51, to Dulce Base, Four Corners region. What people say are not of this world is not true. They are of this world. It, it gives me pause to look at this and hear stories from people. It's as if they're trying to speak to certain individuals and I don't know what the reason is behind it. I hear these stories from these people, and I understand what it is they're going through, what it is they're fearful of, but I think the best thing to tell people is you should not be afraid. You should let them know if you're going to be in the woods that you're there. You don't have to yell. You don't have to scream. You just Hey, I'm coming into the woods. I'm 
just bring in a camera and my dog and we're going to take pictures and leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. Just something simple. Sometimes it helps. Sometimes it doesn't. There's been times where I was camping and my tent was destroyed. I was left alone, but the tent wasn't. There's been times where my camper has been literally moved. It's been tipped over. I've had multiple things happen. And it's not that I think that they're out to hurt me. I mean, those are freaky encounters. Don't get me wrong. But when you're facing an unknown, you have to stand fast and learn very quickly on your feet what it is you need to do to survive. And if survival is just to lay still, then that's what needs to be done. It bothers me that people go out and search for these things because that creates a resonance and a problem that I don't think they truly want. And I don't think any of us want that. The Indians, the Hopis, every culture, even in Alaska, the Inuits, they all speak of it. And they speak very vividly of it. And they talk about how it protects them or how it takes the children. There's so many different stories. So just like every species, there's good species, you know, as with humans. Some of us are good. Some of us are bad with good intentions, and some of us are just evil. And I believe that's the same thing with these. They are benevolent. They are evil. We just don't know which is which. And I can tell you, you'll know when one's coming up on you. Your hair stands up. You know you're being watched. This isn't being in a city. This is being in the middle of the woods. You can't see very far. Or maybe you can, but you know something is not right. You feel it. You know you're being watched. You may not be able to see him but it'll have your heart racing, your blood pressure through the roof, the hairs on your arms and your neck standing up, and you're terrified and you don't understand why. It's probably because you're being watched. They already know you're there, and they want to make sure you're not a threat to them. There's been plenty of other encounters. But I think we'll leave it at this for tonight. If you do go out, you do seek these out. Be intelligent. Seek them out as you would want somebody to come seek you out at your house. Knock before entering. Speak to them. They'll let you know if they want to be seen. Maybe you're not the right person to be seen, to be allowed. Maybe you need to learn more of the ancient ways of the Indians. Understand. Just be smart. Be careful. Because not all of them are that benevolent. And they will strike fear deep inside your soul. Which is another question I have to ask for one day. Why is it that it can get that deep in my soul? So, as you venture out into the woods, keep your heart pure, a song in your heart, and a smile on your face, and understand that we're in their neighborhood when we're walking in the woods. We just need to realize that we're not in our home. We're in theirs. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone loves in the bow. And the five string melodies groove in. With the farmland rose where the roots 
run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back to the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track It's become many been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking a bells to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah In the drummer of Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out Country boy living When I hear the front porch Picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music The pace of the city life drives me wild The only tune is the cars rushing by on the stereos booming When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Some are going backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the tremor on Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out Best sweet tea, come and say.